Okay, so for this week, uh, we're going to do some JavaScript. Let me show you the end result and what we're working toward. You can view this yourself on your web browser or your mobile device. You can go to this address on your browser, vmcinc.net slash random. This is all a JavaScript-based uh, project, uh, some very basic HTML and then a lot of JavaScript behind the scenes. Very ugly, which means there's no CSS in it. But uh, if we had used jQuery Mobile, it would look nicer. It would look like a nicer mobile interface, but the purpose is to focus on the JavaScript. There's an input box where it will ask for your name, go or cancel. So let's say I put in some names. Johnny, Joey, Dee Dee, Tommy, I think you know who I'm talking about here. And then go. That's right. Yeah. So I've saved some names, and now I have the ability to display all the names. They got saved somewhere, and I'm retrieving them. Okay, clear that. I want one random name from my list. I put them in in a specific order, and I want one random name. So I click that, I get Joey. I click again, Dee Dee, etc. randomly. And then let's say, give them to me in any random order. That's the order I put them in. Get them in a random order. So, Johnny, Joey, Tommy, Dee Dee. Or, Tommy, Johnny, Joey, Dee Dee. So it's random. This input is saved and then retrievable. And I can do delete all the names to clear out my information. I get a pop-up. Uh, about to delete all names, proceed. Well, maybe never mind. I can cancel it. Or I actually want to delete it, so I'll say, yes, delete it. And now if I try to display names, no names to display. Please enter at least one. So that's all JavaScript. That's what we're going to work toward today. It's not going to look that nice, but functionally it'll be more complex, because now we're going to focus on user input, storage of the names, retrieval of the names, random retrieval, and introduction to crash course to uh, JavaScript. So if you've never used JavaScript before, this will be your intro. And if you have, um, this hopefully you'll see a thing or two different than you've seen before. So that's going to be at vmcinc.net slash random. You should open up Notepad with a new blank document, and we'll write our basic 10 lines basic HTML file, doc type, HTML tags, head tags, body tags, meta car set, title, Uh, JS intro and body h1 random names so 10 lines very basic HTML file we'll save it of course uh, today's date dot HTML shortcut, of course, was if you had saved your plain HTML file from last week, you just simply open it up, or practice makes perfect. Now, I do have the option turned, on, turned off on uh, Notepad. We have the option turned off on Notepad to auto-complete. Obviously, if we're going to type head, we need to close head. But most civilized code editors will help you with autocomplete. I've started to type head. Let it finish typing head for me. I didn't want that on in the beginning because I wanted us to practice. But let me show you where you can turn that on in Notepad if you'd like to now get the shortcuts for Notepad to finish your tags for you. If you haven't finished here, that's okay. One moment. We'll go up to the settings. Let's try this. Go to settings, preferences. And we've got, where did I see it? Uh, 
oh, auto completion. So on the left side, preferences here, auto completion, it's off. Enable auto completion on each input. Well, if you turn that on, it will automatically complete your functions and words. Um, you could turn on function parameter hint on input, I guess. I'm not going to turn it on. I'm going to write it by hand. But that's where you can go in, in Notepad++ to turn that on or off if you want that. That was in Settings, Preferences, Auto Completion, and then turn on Enable. This is what you need at least. Did that run out over there? So 10 lines, we saw in the example we need to get some input from the user. So here we'll touch on forms. Forms are a way for us to get user input. We can do text input, number input, some of the more modern things that we can capture are emails, dates, other things like that. Uh, so we want to collect the person's um, name. After the H1, we will create a form, F-O-R-M. It has a pair. It's HTML. And this will mark that what we're about to do is create a form for input. Some of the more famous forms that you see on a regular basis are like the Google search engine. It asks you to type, you press search, that's a form. That's user input. Another one is the Facebook login screen. Name and email, login, that's a form. It's taking user input. So a form is for user input. User input. We can um, collect a variety of um, input. Let's say we had a complex form where we're taking a person's first name, last name, date of birth, hobbies, uh, age, height, all of that stuff. Those are different sorts of units of information that we can div divide up into uh, pieces of the form, and that's a field set. So we'll start off here, field set. So that would be collections of information related to each other. Ours is not going to be complex at all. We're just asking for a name. But if we had, like if you're going to make your own app, there was a, a student that uh, she was making this uh, exercise tracking app. Uh, she uh, worked, I believe, uh, at a junior high or something and in the PE department, and she wanted to collect, uh, you know, the number of jumping jacks that the student did that, that week or, um, you know, the height of, of the child. All of that information is stuff to input and it's in different uh, conceptual pieces. Name, first name, last name, uh, street address, that's a chunk of info. Then we've got weight and height and arm distance or whatever. That's a different chunk of info related. So a field set groups together inputs that you're going to collect. We then have a legend visual Visual marker for collection of info. Field set internally behind the scenes. It's a tag. It has meaning. We can do things with it. But visually, for the user, it doesn't look like anything quite special. So for the user, so what they can see, um, we have legend. This is what will appear. is what will appear on screen for the user.
we're going to ask simply for the person to type their name. Common practice is to have a label and the actual input. <clears throat> this input will be the box where the user types their name. But we then need to show on screen, what is this box for? That's the label. I'll say uh, full name. Save it and run it just to, it's not going to work at all yet, of course, but save it and run it to see what it's looking like. You should see some visual things on screen. The legend and the field set uh, will be like a border around everything. Then the text full name will appear right next to a box. Maybe it'll look like a box. We haven't fully filled in all the attributes. Let's see what it looks like here so far run it in Firefox. That's what we've got so far. So the H1 on top, of course, we've seen that. There's the form that isn't anything visual. But then the enter name part. Enter name. That's the legend. And the field set is a group of info. We're only collecting their full name. This label is related to this input. This box. You can actually click on the box and type something, but nothing will happen because we it's very incomplete. Nothing has been set up yet at all with this. Technically, we haven't even said what kind of input to deal with. This label, it's, it's good practice to sort of link a label with its corresponding input field. The way we do that is to the label, we add the attribute for, F-O-R. We will give this a unique name in a moment. So this label is used for this input box. We can name that input box anything we want. I'm going to call it in name. This is my own convention. This can be called anything we want, and we would see a 101 examples of what people on a tutorial will tell you how to do it, but I'm doing it this way because for me what makes sense is this is an input box for the person's name. So I could call it input name. I'm just calling it in name. The input element itself needs an attribute of name in name. So now the, these are related, these are linked. This label is used for this input with the name of in. Same thing on both. What's that? Yes, that input corresponds with this label. It's for that label, yes. We're going to need to write JavaScript to capture what's in that name and process it. Very common to do then to add an ID so that the JavaScript can reference it easier. And we can give it the same ID as the name as the for label in name. We're able to capture a variety of types of data. We didn't specify what kind of data here. It kind of knew text data. We should specify. So that will be, oh, actually, uh, let's back up before the ID. Oh, let's back up before name. It doesn't matter the order in this case, but I'll explain why in a moment. Let's back up to give the attribute right after the input. We will do type equals text. We could have written type equals text right after ID. I personally always leave an ID or a class as the last attribute. Because when I'm scanning my hundreds of lines of code, and I often have to refer back to a class or an ID, 
I can find it quickly because it'll be the last item in the line, in the, in the element, in the tag. It would be no problem if you wrote type equals text as the last item. But I personally like to leave ID or class as the last attribute. The name has to be used for form. It's an attribute that gives us a name. Basically, name and for are related. So if you're going to use for, you should use name. Technically, we don't have to use name, then we shouldn't use for, but we should still use ID. ID is the one that's usually going to be much more important in JavaScript. But good user experience and good code, if we're going to create an input, it should have a name because we should have a label for accessibility, for accessibility standards. So it looks redundant to have the same thing three times, but it's just common practice and good practice to do it. For the ID or for the Say that again? For the search loop, because you want to search somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the ID would be for that, exactly. Let's add one more attribute here, input type, text, and then placeholder equals your name, for example. Save it and run it should look the same as before, except for one difference. But now it's more properly set up. We've got a label with a for attribute, a name attribute, an ID attribute. We've specified that it should collect text. And placeholder is placeholder text. Now I'll see text typed here for me to kind of guide people what should you type here that disappears when you start typing. Now it looks like uh, a notepad. So your attributes are usually red. Placeholder doesn't seem to be seeing it as red, but I guess it's okay. So if we write a note I'm going to write the note above it. <coughs> Label is visible to user and linked to input box with for and name. On these various input types, if we were to put input type equals date, D-A-T-E, Depending on the browser, it may pop up a calendar to let you pick a date. If you put input type equals email, depending on the browser, it may only allow you to type an email address, which has a certain pattern, doesn't it? Something at something dot something. So depending on the browser, there are these other types, these modern types, that are sort of like for error checking. Had date. If I had date here in Firefox, doesn't care. But if I look at it in uh, Chrome and I try to add a date, it gives me a calendar, depending on the browser. Something like that, browsers interpret that type of thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's always uh, trouble uh, and more work for us as developers when, whenever there's user input. Uh, because there's a saying, uh, you can't make anything foolproof because there's so many ingenious fools. So there's going to be so many instances where you think, I programmed it the right way, there could be no problem here, and someone figures out a way to do a problem accidentally. So the long answer is that we would have to write more code to properly check, did the right input get input? Uh, so if we can't rely on the standards, we have to code our own error checking. 
So you mean the tax has to be on profit or you can put that in the or on the you can put numeric in here actually it will accept numbers but if I put number it some browsers will only let a number be typed in and some won't care so then we have to write more code to check what was actually put in and then deal with that result we'll keep it simple and we'll assume that it will behave next line yes I'm sorry, what is the placeholder doing one more time well, whatever we type into placeholder will appear on screen to guide the user. This is what you should type, because let's say we want a we want someone to type a username, but they don't understand. They have to write first letter, last letter. So if we put a placeholder of exactly what they should type, that'll kind of guide them. This is what you should type, and it goes away when they start typing. So that should be coming out. Yeah, try to refresh and. Um, Check your spelling, placeholder. We want a, um, let's say a person is starting to type, and we want to cancel that. Uh, we want to start over. So on the next line, input of type button value reset this creates a button not only can input be used for boxes where someone types it can also be used to create buttons now we have plain old HTML so far we haven't done any JavaScript yet this is plain old HTML uh, and if we had jQuery Mobile, we'd be able to put a, an icon on it and other, other things. But this is a plain old HTML, like 1.0. Value is the text that appears on the button. So if I put value equals cancel, that's what the text that will appear on the button on screen. So the purpose of that is that if someone's starting to type something, let me start over. Reset. Not a button, a reset, sorry, getting ahead of myself. Of input type of reset, reset button. This will reset the form. I could say value clear, and it changes the button text. So I'm starting to type something, clear it. There's the form to start over. Now, uh, I have a, my browser really tall and thin, so I have my button below. If you've got it on the side, don't worry about it. You can move it below or keep it on the side. It doesn't matter at this point. After the clear button, another input type, this time button, value, save, or go, or proceed, or whatever value, whatever text you want to appear. Now you also see input type equals submit. So there is the submit version of the button, there is the reset version of the button, and here I have generically a type button. I want to do it generically here because often with the input type of submit, it's often linked to some server-side processing script. Uh, what does that mean? Don't worry about it. So we will just do input type button, and uh, we're going to then have the JavaScript to have it process this, embed it in order for the JavaScript then to, uh, to activate when we press this button, this needs a unique ID. So input type of button and value save and then ID of btn save. Notice my spelling. Uh, it's pretty common in JavaScript when you're writing your own self-created 
code like IDs and classes and functions, as we'll get to. It's often common, when there are more than one word, to capitalize them, but starting with the second word. So I think I mentioned it briefly before. If I had called this my btn save, I would have called it like this, with the second and following words capitalized, not the first one. You can, of course, call it button save. That's not that common. That's more common. That's called intercaps, also known as camel caps, because if you had a long name like that, those two capital letters look like the humps of a camel. Camel caps. Camel caps or intercaps. And this will matter in JavaScript, your capitalization. So perhaps to save yourself effort, keep it all lowercase. That way you don't forget that I capitalize or not. But you're going to see very commonly intercaps. It has a unique ID which we can then um, access or reference the button via JavaScript. We're going to take user input, do some processing of it, and then display it on screen. So after the form, Let's create a div. Div is often for a placeholder. It's invisible on screen, which we will then use to display results. It needs a unique ID so that we can reference it via JavaScript. ID div show. This placeholder is empty. Eventually, when we do the JavaScript magic, it will then be filled with actual content. So we can write here invisible placeholder. To display results. Div has a pair. Generically, it doesn't do anything until you fill it with things and give it a unique unique identifier so that, then we, so that then we can do something with it in, in JavaScript. As we're going to write this JavaScript, I'm going to remind us to start to look at our developer's console, that debug panel F12. That's going to be invaluable to us, especially as we start to write JavaScript where we make errors, because the developer's panel will give us feedback, like you mistyped something, or you know there was a problem with your script, and it'll tell you exactly what line of JavaScript to go and fix. So you want to remember to have your developer's panel open in the browser, F12. Um, just to see if everything's okay so far for me, I'm going to run it. And press F12 to bring up the panel. Console, nothing seems to be going wrong here. Good. On screen, it looks like how I expect. If I start to type a name and clear it, it clears. If I type a name and save it, nothing happens yet. I haven't gotten that far. But at least no errors in the console. Let's pause here. That's what it should look like. Anyone need a little help? We can write JavaScript inline, embedded, or external, just like CSS. It's not good practice to write inline CSS, and it's even worse practice to write inline JavaScript. It's OK to write embedded CSS, and it's OK to write embedded JavaScript, but it's often best to write external CSS and external JavaScript. To keep it all nice and simple, we're going to write embedded JavaScript. We're going to write JavaScript in a block where it's all consolidated in one spot, because it's just going to be one file. But if we had a more complex project, 
I would save all of my JavaScript in a in a you know JavaScript.js file, and we'll do that later. Yes. Maybe you do something. How do you know how the tool for the node that has to be from the point? We do something and then you clear. How do we? How does it clear? <coughs> that it has to go to the input. Let's say if you have a couple of input, like a first name and last name, uh -huh. that's going to happen. They will all clear. If I had more than one input, everything clears because this this uh, clear button is in this is in the same form as every other input. If I make a different form to collect different data, this clear will not know to clear that other form. But any inputs in this form will be affected by this clear. Can you control this one in that particular form? By we can do that too. Uh, right now, input type reset, however, is the nuclear option. It does it for everything. If we do input type button and then write some custom JavaScript, it can then only clear one input field and leave seven alone. A different field set, uh, it's still. You can have more than one field set, yes, because I could be collecting here. Uh, you know, uh, name information, and down over here, uh, home information. Mm -hmm. Yep, as long as everything, the form is the whole unifier. Yes. Yeah, so any any field sets in the same form will all clear. Yes. Okay, we'll be there one moment. So save it at this point. Make sure that it's uh, kind of looks like mine. You shouldn't see any errors in your console. Okay, so here, now let's start to write some JavaScript. We have a box where we can start to accept input, so now we need to process it. After our div, we'll start a script block. This is an HTML tag that says what will be inside of this will be script, JavaScript. Now sometimes you see uh, in tutorials and such, it'll say script, don't type this, of type text slash JavaScript, don't type this. You could to be the most, most, most correct, but because we're running HTML5, whenever it sees script, it knows it's JavaScript. If it was something else like CGI or Ruby or PHP or some other thing, we might have to type text slash Ruby. But we don't have to because it's HTML5. Technically, when we wrote style, I don't remember if I mentioned it, but when we had style for CSS at the top, an old way would have been style type equals text slash CSS. But again, because we're in HTML5, um, it assumes CSS in the style block, and it assumes JavaScript in the script block. So here's a few bytes of text that we 
can save in typing. This is JavaScript. Inside of JavaScript, then, we need to start using the JavaScript comment. We must use the JS comment from now on, which is slash asterisk and the opposite asterisk slash. If you try to type the HTML comment, um, that's not quite right because we're inside of a block of JavaScript. Good eye. That wasn't closed, but since it was the last thing, I guess it worked. Okay, so uh, what follows is JavaScript in here. The, this comment can be a multi-line comment. If we divide it up, <coughs> opening and closing, everything in between is a comment. It's green in, in this basic color coding. But um, that's the single or multi-line. We uh, played a little bit with JavaScript. Remember we did alert and a pop-up happened and that sort of thing. Well, let's collect the information that's in that input box and then um, save it and do something with it. And I want to start early on to say something kind of advanced with JavaScript just to get used to it. Let's type this and then I'll explain what we typed. Open and close parentheses, open and close parentheses, semicolon. Inside of the first open and close parentheses, function, lowercase, open and close parentheses, open and close, curly brace. Now again, I like to teach when there's a pair of things, type the pair. Because you saw, I had an open and close parentheses, and then an open and close parentheses, semicolon. Then I had, in the first parentheses, function with an open and close parentheses and an open and close curly brace. Be very careful. Let me zoom in right here so you see exactly the differences. Parentheses, parentheses, semicolon, function, parentheses, curly braces. No spaces anywhere there. This is rather advanced, but I want to say it right away. This is the best practice to write JavaScript. This is an immediately invoked function expression. It's just an advanced um, way of writing JavaScript to deal with namespace conflicts and other really advanced stuff that we don't really need to get to right now. But I'm just going to say you should type this always when you're going to write JavaScript. So I'm going to make a comment above it. Immediately invoked. Immediately invoked. invoked, invoked, function, expression, common practice, writing, modern, valid, good, JavaScript. It also abbreviated um, I I F E Ify Ify immediately invoke function expression. It's too advanced to talk about what it does right now, but you should just know you should type this always when you're writing JavaScript. And I want to write this right away because. All of our JavaScript then is going to be inside of these curly braces. We'll talk about what functions are and namespaces and variables and all that stuff uh, as we go on. But I want to type this and then between the two curly braces, enter a couple of times to break it. And now all of our JavaScript will be inside of this function. Everything that we type will be inside of those curly braces. So I wanted to type them right away because it's a little more confusing to type it after the fact. You can have a few dozen lines of code, like 
50 lines of code and then to add it after the fact, it's going to get confusing. So I want to add it first. We also want to activate strict mode because JavaScript, when we get with into these kinds of programming languages, we can have syntax errors and we can have logic errors. And syntax errors are the easier ones to fix. Syntax is that you typed it wrong. I typed function wrong. That's a syntax error. There's no function. There's a function. Syntax. It's wrong. But logic errors are the harder ones to fix. Logically, what I wanted to do was add two numbers and then divide a number and show the results. Somewhere along the, the lines, I put multiply instead of divide. That's a logical problem, a logical error. Not an error in how math works, but a logical error. Those are harder to figure out. The basics, or the default, is that we have a sort of loose um, error checking engine. We want to activate the more strict one so that if we get some of these silent errors, we want to be made aware of them to fix them. Again, this is another advanced thing that I want to say early on. In quotes, use space strict at the end, semicolon. This activates in the web browser strict mode where we can get more errors. More errors are good, so that way we can figure out the problems in our code. We would be getting perhaps a few silent errors if we didn't have this mode on, and then it's harder to figure out what did I type wrong. So we have to do this as well. Double slash creates a single line comment. So only what follows past the double slash is commented. The asterisk slash pair makes a block of comments. I use those often, but I use more often, I believe, the single line comment. A double slash somewhere in your JavaScript will turn the rest of the line into a comment. Strict mode or errors. These three lines right here, personally and in what I've learned and read, are some of the best ways to write JavaScript. Uh, you're going to see many articles or books that follow this sort of standard. And the th great thing about standard standards is that anyone can make a standard. So hopefully people follow the standard. And so here, this is a good standard to use in JavaScript. If we didn't write this at all, it would still work, what we're trying to do. But when we get into more complex programs, having something set up like this will help us in the long term. And the details will become more apparent as we get more complex. Let's We need a mechanism to check what has been typed into the box, store it somewhere, and then retrieve it. Uh, we touched on this a little bit before. Let's write, I'm on line 25, document dot get element by ID, open and close, parentheses. Is the document object. Every piece of HTML that exists in the body can be referenced, can be accessed by JavaScript. So we're saying, let's go look in the document, in the body, basically, and let's get an element by its unique ID. So we have a method, we have a command being used upon an object, which is everything in the body, get element by ID. And notice the spelling. It has to be this way. ID is not capital I, not capital D. It's only capital I, lowercase d. In quotes, 
the name of the button that will trigger a series of steps. You may have thought, okay, we'll type the name of the box. We're not there yet. We need to activate that button to do a series of things. Check what's in the box, save it somewhere, display it. We need to do a series of steps. But all of that is triggered by first clicking the button. So we're going to get an element by its ID, which we call btn, save. So btn save, that's what I called it up there. The save button has a unique ID. In JavaScript, we're saying, let's pay attention to that button. Dot on click. In the event of a click, or in the event of a double click, or a click and hold, do something equals fn name save. We're going to click on a button. All of this basically here is saying we're going to click on a button. Once we click on the button, run a function, we're inventing, we're calling function fn name save. We're going to save a name and do other things with it, a function that we will define. But this is setting up an event handler. I'll make a note here. event handler for clicking on a button. Call the function fn save, name save. So I like the double slash here because you can type that quickly. The rest of the line is a comment. You don't have to worry about closing it. The rest of the line is a comment. You could do this way, but you have to remember to close it, or else everything will be a comment and your code will be deactivated. So there's going to be a click on a button, run a function, call a function, invoke a function, execute a function, different ways to say it. Next line, then, we're going to define. What does this function do? There's no built-in JavaScript command called fn name save. We made it up. There is a built-in get element by ID and there's a built-in on click, but there's no built-in fn name save. So we'll say function space fn name save, open close parentheses, open close curly brace. Oh, and then also we're using the uh, semicolon at the end of every line, except this line Um, which I will then also break into its own line. End of fn name save function. No semicolon needed. So you can look up for a long time when I first learned this several years ago, uh, I would see some people writing a some example code writing a semicolon there and some not. And I looked it up and uh, both camps uh, are adamant that they're right, that you do need a semicolon, that you don't need a semicolon. Uh, it seems that the more correct one seems to be no semicolon. But if you put it there, it should still all work. But no semicolon after the end of the function definition. inside of the box, or inside of a function name save alert, the alert method, the alert command, in quotes, hello. This is not doing what we want yet, 
but I just want to make sure all of our JavaScript is functioning so far. Save it and run it. Don't bother typing anything to the box yet, but click the Save button. You should get a pop-up that says Hello. Let's pause here and do our first break. If it's all working good, if not, call me over. I want to see that this is working so far, even though we haven't done really that much. There's still a lot that could go wrong here. Spelling mistakes, for example. Uh, if something is going wrong, perhaps uh, look inside of your developer's console, F12, and you might see some, some feedback, like me. I forced an error. But that might, you might get an error down there. Let's take a break. It's 6.57. We'll be back at 7.07. .07. If you needed any help, call me over. And here's the code of the JavaScript so far.